How you guys doing? Week 10. After this, we have two more weeks. So we end on the 8th. That's our last night. Because I can't be here on the 15th and then Thanksgiving. And so, yeah. So two more. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. So we've worked our way through the Trinity. Gone through God the Father. Gone through God the Son. And we're going to go through the Holy Spirit. And we'll spend a couple weeks talking about what he's up to these days. Um, so entrusted, know, confess, trust, and walk by the Holy Spirit. And here's our essential truth. This is from a creed. We'll see it in a few minutes. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who is in unity with the Father and the Son, is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. And a little bonus statement from John Calvin from his institutes, so this is the early um, 1500s, the things spoken concerning Christ profit us by the secret working of the Spirit. This is large section on how the grace of God is distributed. So this is from the institutes, and here's what he says in the first chapter of that section. Yet since we see that not all indiscriminately embrace that communion with Christ that's offered through the gospel, meaning not everybody hears and receives the gospel. Reason itself teaches us to climb higher and higher and examine into the secret energy of the Spirit, so the, the Spirit's secret working, because we can't see Him. We can't know specifically what he's doing at any given point in time. And what John Calvin does is he walks through all the things that the Spirit does in the work of salvation. And from there, by which we come to enjoy Christ and all his benefits. And so we're going to step through these three areas. What does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? How has it been faithfully and carefully expressed down through the ages? We won't go through every age, but... And then practical implications. Why is this truth important? How do we apply it? So, before we jump into that, I want to get y'all talking. Um, so, when you think about the Holy Spirit, what do you think about? Who is He? What does He do? What has He done? Conviction? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a passage about that in John, right? He, con he convicts the world of truth and righteousness and judgment. Comforts? Comforts? He's called the comforter, right? Because I'll read something and it won't make any sense, and I'll pray for the Spirit to explain it, and then it'll make sense. Scripture talks about that. Guides. What's that? It leads us into all righteousness. Into righteousness. Yeah. Anybody else? Protects. Like the spirit would leave the king or would leave whoever, or the spirit would come mm -hmm. upon them. Or like that. But in yep. the New Testament, I'm thankful this, once you're sealed, the spirit doesn't leave. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose he could, but he just chooses not to. Well, Jesus is uh, with the Apocalypse. So there's no more of this coming and going stuff. If you accept him as Christ, he comes to dwell within us. Well, that's true. Spirit, so he's there yeah. all the time. That's true, and that's why the seal part. The yes. down payment of our inheritance, the down seal down. of the Spirit. Yeah. So he's he uh, permanently indwells. Yeah. Well, that's true. He points to Christ. It's us and 
We always point to Christ. No, it just seems to sacrifice. Oh yeah. Yeah, he uh, he points to and glorifies the Son. Okay. This is a lot of his present work. What's he done? What did he do before he was sent by the Father, the promise of Christ? So Old Testament, think Old Testament. Sealed the mouths of lions, paid big tree of war, came through the leaves whenever they broke the, the Gideon and then so that the people who were fighting all came and went in, killed each other off. And that was the Holy Spirit that did all those? Yeah, it was God somehow or another. <laughs> yeah. It was a mighty rushing wind. It sounded like the Holy Spirit to me. I don't know. <laughs> what? Passover? What's that? Passover? Going through all the, the death angel? I don't know if that's the angel of death, angel. but probably not the Holy Spirit. But, but yeah. I think he's been like a, a lot of like, like time in like a tabernacle. You know, it's like the, the Jews had to sacrifice like a lamb or something there in the tabernacle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I hadn't thought about that before, but that's possible. That's good. Called fire down from heaven, and then he took, then this, then he called rain up, and then you, know, you had this big deluge, and he outran the, the, the chariots to get to the, the town. And the, I think the power of the Holy Spirit was in Elijah at that time, so he could make that run. Yeah, that's possible. He, because he he did that with several times, like with Samson. Yeah. Whenever Samson cut his hair, he basically left him alone. He said, I'll make this right. Wouldn't the Spirit can, like, speak to rulers in dreams? So, like, um, uh, Moses is talking to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Wouldn't that be the Spirit that was... Or when Abraham was saying that Sarah was his sister, and the the guy figured out uh, that it was his wife in a no, dream. Possible. I'm going to look at some specifics. Well, some, the first time when we hear about it, yeah. he says he would cross the, the, the spear would cross the surface of the water. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to look at some specifics where we it clearly says this is the work of the Spirit. Okay, because you wrote right? No, we didn't, didn't, didn't fail. I mean, those things are possible. Um, but but there, are, there are very clear expressions of the, of the Spirit at work in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at some of those. So, um, so we've, we've done this exercise of what's in the grand narrative, what's in the Scripture. And we're going to look at a few different ways that we see Him present in the Scripture. So we'll start with the Old Testament, the revelation of the Spirit in the narratives of the Old Testament, starting with Genesis 1. So we'll start there. Uh, prophecy of the Holy Spirit by the Old Testament prophets. So the prophecy of his coming in a new way. Um, we'll talk about that. The proclaiming and witnessing of the Spirit by John the Baptist. Um, we'll see that. The declaration of and promise of the Holy Spirit by the incarnate Son. So what did Jesus say about him in the Gospels, in the beginning of the book of Acts? And then other things were said about him in the Gospels as well, but we'll look just for now at, this, at the Son. Uh, the attestation and narration of the, Holy, of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. 28 chapters in Acts, 56 times the Holy Spirit is directly mentioned. That's almost two times a chapter, right? And then confirmation and confession throughout the apostolic teachings and writings continued by the church. So where you see some specific references of him in the Old Testament in those 39 books, you see a ton of reference to him in the New Testament. And you shouldn't be surprised by that because Christ, um, well, he appears during the time of Christ, but then he's being sent as Christ is leaving and he's all over the place, especially in the book of Acts. And we'll see that in a minute. All right. So let's just look at a few in the Old Testament narrative. First, Genesis 1. Was Acts ever referred to as Acts of the Holy Spirit? 
No. No. Normally it's been Acts of the Apostles. Um, but uh, in, uh, so Genesis 1, 1 through 2, here's, here's the first one. Second verse in the Bible. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a formless and desolate emptiness, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then creation begins. God begins creation. So the Spirit's present and active during the creation of the heavens and the earth. Of course, then in John 1.1, 1, 1, who takes precedence there? The sun. The sun, yeah. Which is pretty natural because John's going to be declaring the incarnation of the sun, but also beginning with the deity of the sun, and then you don't read anything there about the Holy Spirit. Yet, Genesis 1 says he's present, he's active. So from John 1, we know it's a Trinitarian work. The work of the Father, the presence and work of the Spirit, although we don't know exactly what the Spirit does, and then the work of the Son. Genesis 41, 38, so we're going later in that book. So this is Pharaoh. This is the Pharaoh in the time of Joseph. Pharaoh asks his officials, can we find a man like Joseph, one in whom the Spirit of God is present? Um, because Joseph was able to do what? Interpret dreams. Um, he sees the wisdom that Joseph has and that ability. So that's an indication that Joseph had the presence of the Spirit, now not the permanently indwelling Spirit. Here's Exodus 35, Moses to the Israelites. And he's talking about who the Lord has given to help build the tabernacle, do some of the work there. See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. So you get his genealogy. That's an important thing that happens, especially in the Old Testament, right? He has filled him with the spirit of God, with skill, with understanding, with knowledge in all kinds of work. And he goes on to explain what Bezalel is going to do. Then in Numbers 11.25, And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to them. And he took some of the spirit that was on Moses and put it into the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. So you see at times in the narratives how the spirit is, is providing the ability for some individuals to do prophecy. So there's a number of times, this is just a few, but a number of times in those narrative books where the Spirit is mentioned directly. Spirit of God, Spirit of God, Spirit of God. Then the prophets. Isaiah 63, 10, but they rebelled, so he's talking about the Israelites, and offended his Holy Spirit, so he turned into an enemy and fought against them. His people remembered the ancient times. Where is the one who brought them out of the sea, along with the shepherd of the flock? Where is the one who placed his Holy Spirit among them? Ezekiel 36, 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. So this is the Lord talking about, talking generally about the time when he'll restore Israel. They've been in captivity. They're in captivity. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and bring it about that you walk in my statutes and are careful to follow my ordinances. Now, did that happen when the Israelites came out of captivity? Or is he talking about something in the future? Well, it's perhaps a little of both. They did come out. They were initially obedient through how they were led to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city. But that didn't last. Um, they were not faithful. Yeah. <laughs> 
weird. Yeah. <laughs> and so prophecy is, prophecies are interesting to read because sometimes there's kind of a near fulfillment, but not a full fulfillment. And then there's a future fulfillment. Um, so the reader would think, the one who heard this prophecy might think, this is going to happen to us when we come out of captivity. But then it's, when, the, when Christ comes and sends the Spirit, the Lord sends the Spirit to indwell believers that this begins, or at least begins to begin. Right? I will put my Spirit within you. Here's Joel, Joel chapter 2, and we'll see this reference again in the book of Acts, because this is what Peter uses in his sermon at, on Pentecost. It will come about that after this, I will pour my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams, your young men will see visions, and even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, all mankind doesn't mean every single person, but he's talking about that it's going to be something that any person from any race from any from any st station in life can receive through Christ, and that's what we see happen. And the believers are going to receive the Spirit, and it's not going to be restrictive to the people that were just prophesying, those prophets, or um, the king for a period of time had the Spirit. It's going to be given to everyone who comes to faith in Christ. I will pour out my spirit. And that's how Peter refers to it. And even when Peter refers to it, it's not a full fulfillment. Some things that are said along with this um, don't happen. But that promise. Now we come to the New Testament. So you have those prophecies about what's going to happen. Now we come to the New Testament. And here's John. Um, so John is is talking about what Jesus asked him to do. Jesus asked him to baptize him, and John's thinking, no, I can't do that. Uh, but Jesus says, no, you're going to do it. And he says, here's what he says about Jesus. Uh, this is before the baptism. As for me, he's explaining what, who he is. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me, and he knows who that is, is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You're going to receive a different baptism for him. I'm just preparing you for the kingdom of God. I'm preparing you for him. But when he comes, this is the baptism where you'll receive, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the reception of the Holy Spirit. So here's the baptism. After he's baptized, uh, and this is where he had, John had told him no, and Jesus said no, yes. Yeah. Is that like the burning away of the uh, sinful nature? Any guesses on what that means? Anybody have an idea of what that means? That's a great question. One particular point when they were in the upper room, it came down like tongues of fire and lit, and lit on. <laughs> yeah. Since then, I don't think that happened quite like that. Well, following verse 11, uh -huh. starting in verse 11, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy. And remember, the audience here is is Jews, Jews. generally, but yeah. the Pharisees also as well. Come. Yeah. Uh, he will he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will thoroughly clear the his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Yeah. So, so it's Judgment Day. Fire yeah. And more for the Right. That. Yep. I think it can be like the like a conviction as well. And then you know what the Holy Spirit does is he he kind of removes all these impurities in our life. Mm -hmm. He smelts us down to this this pure, you know, he tries to remove all yeah. that in our life. So, so maybe that fire is is the conviction from the Holy Spirit of, of melting down the things that don't serve us you know, anymore. Yeah. That's a true way to describe those things. Absolutely. But 
in context here, what, what Matt said, that's, it's the, it's the um, believers will receive the Holy Spirit. Those are, that, that don't believe, they're going to be judged, right? So that's the, that's the contextual here. But, but you're right that you can think about our purification um, and conviction in that, in that sense. Yeah. Great question. So here's the baptism. After he was baptized, Jesus came up, came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he, John the Baptist, saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and setting on him. And behold, a voice from the heaven said, that's the Father, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So that's a Trinitarian verse right there. You've got the Son, you've got the Spirit, you've got the voice of the Father. But the Spirit of God descending as a dove and, sit, and setting on him. So he's now present with the Son during his ministry. And then here's later when John, these are John's parting words to his disciples prior to his death. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have, um, it's interesting because um, how is the Spirit present with Jesus during his ministry? Um, if you start with the incarnation, I mean, that's the Spirit at work so that, so that the birth of Jesus happens, right? Uh, not by human man, but by the Holy Spirit instead. So that, that um, protects his, uh, from that one thing it does is it protects him from being born in sin, right? So you have the incarnation, okay, does he stay around then? Well, probably not. Then you have this where he's descending. Does he stay around then? Well, possibly. You also have age 12, though, that shows that Jesus' divinity, where he was, he had great wisdom already. So he was the Holy Spirit with him at that time and in him at that time, where he being God already had the wisdom with him. Grew Wisdom and stature mm -hmm. in favor with God and man. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so then you have the spirit present in the wilderness when Jesus is, is fasting in the wilderness. It's like just the difference between omnipresence and manifest presence. Like, you know, yeah. Omnipresence, but he's manifesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing it could represent, because when we do get to the book of Acts, um, there's confirmation uh, of different groups of people and different events where the Holy Spirit is obviously present. Um, and it could be, so Jesus declared it was right for him to be baptized, and this could be one of the reasons. So the Holy Spirit would be present and evident at his baptism. And you've got John as a witness of that. But we, Jesus, yeah. being fully God, wouldn't need the presence of the Spirit like we do because we're not fully God. So, of course, yeah. he was fully God whether... The Spirit was, because they're yeah. one God. So the Spirit is always with Jesus yeah. because he's already fully God. So it would, if you think thinking that Jesus is just a man, it could be the interpretation. If he was just a human, then you're waiting for the Spirit to come and empower, make, empower him to be God. But if he's yeah. fully God, he and the Spirit are already one. The Spirit came down to identify 
to John. Yeah. And to those who I were was, John's disciples at that time. I was always more thinking, though, myself, that it was more of an understanding of for everybody else. Yeah. To see who he was. I, that's, yeah. that's right. yeah, and 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 so yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that the Spirit does is give us understanding, other understanding. You have to be careful how you say that. Jesus is God, but not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God, but He's not Jesus. Because that's what the Pentecost is for. That's yeah. why they baptized in the name of Jesus because they, they said, well, what's God's name? Jesus. What's the Holy Spirit's name? Jesus. I've actually heard one preach that. And so we have to be careful that we realize that there are three persons in one Godhead. Three in one. Right. So I say three yeah. persons yeah. in one Godhead. Right. One I think what you're saying, what's, what's your name, by the way? Reese. Reese. I think what Reese is saying is you've got the presence of the Father, you've got the presence of the Son, You've got the presence of the Holy Spirit. So there's a Trinitarian presence evident in Jesus' baptism. Um, and I am, I kind of agree that it was there for our benefit to show us. Certainly that. To show us the truth. Yeah, certainly and that. to show John that this is who you've been waiting for all this. Yeah. And there's also consistency with, consistency with the events that will happen when people receive the gospel and there's evidence there by the presence of the Holy Spirit, not all the time, but in certain places in Acts, because the gospel is going to go out to the world and you see Jews receive it, then you see Samaritans, then you see Cornelius' home, then you see um, the people that, oh, we've only been baptized by John. So you see these different events to show you, to validate that, that just like Joel said, no, not Joel, Ezekiel said, to validate that uh, God is redeeming people from, from every people group, everywhere. Uh, anyway, so John 3, uh, and this is, again, this is John the Baptist's last words. Um, the one, the one who has accepted his, Jesus' testimony, has certified that God is true. For he whom God sent speaks the word of God. So John the Baptist is making a testimony about who Christ is. For he does not give the Spirit sparingly. So John proclaims him. John witnesses baptism and sees the Spirit and the Father. And then John declares who Jesus is, adding on that, for he does not give the Spirit sparingly. That's an interesting phrase, too. Okay, declaration of by the Son and promise of. So here's, here's Jesus. He's going into the to the synagogue, um, and he, Jesus, unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, and then he quotes this, this, uh, this Old Testament passage, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now he began to say to them, as if, couple later. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I am he. I am the one that's prophesied. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. So there's another instance where, okay, um, is that a continued presence of the spirit when he declares that about himself? Matthew 10. Uh, but when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you were to say. For what you say will be given you in that hour. He's talking about his disciples when they're going to go out. 
For it is not you who are speaking, but it is the spirit of your father who is speaking in you. So that's going to be true when they go out for that period of time, but not indwelling yet. But it's also going to be true about what Jesus promise, promises when he leaves and they're making testimony. And you see John 14, 25 and 26, and he describes that very thing about what the presence of the Spirit in them is going to be when they're, when they're going out to uh, proclaim the gospel. John, and here's John 15, 26. Uh, when the Helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, namely the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify about me. And you are also testifying as well, because you have been with me from the beginning. Next chapter, he's going to say this. He's going to explain that he's leaving, and he's going to talk about that the Spirit is coming. Um, and he's going to talk about that at length, again, reminding them about how the Spirit will be there to, to help them when they witness him. But this statement, it's to your advantage that I'm leaving. It's going to be better for you when the Spirit is present than me being here, staying, staying here with you. Because he knows he's going to depart, resurrect and depart. But it's to your advantage, and then he explains about the work of the Spirit. Why would you think it's an advantage to have the Spirit versus having Jesus with you that you can see, that you can talk to, that, uh, oh yeah, he'll, he'll show us what to do. We'll just walk with him and he'll show us what to do. Why, do you, why did, would Jesus say it's an advantage that the Spirit will be with you, not me? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're just seeing Jesus, you're not transformed. Is that you're not being transformed? Yeah. And have that be actually be able to fully understand who Jesus is and what God is actually saying to you. Yeah. Is that is that right? That's certainly that's definitely one thing because uh, you're regenerated, and then you're um, you've got the indwelling Holy Spirit doing that secret work that you don't really know what he's specifically doing at any point in time. And yet, um, he is, when you pray, as we'll see in a minute, I mean, he's translating the prayers. When you read the scripture, as you were saying, he's teaching you the scriptures. Right? He's... He, and. <laughs> Whereas with the Holy Spirit, He is within all of us. That's right. All the time. Yeah. And also, if the Son was here, He wouldn't be at the right hand of the Father. The Father would be moving on our behalf. Yeah. Very good point. <laughs> I really appreciate that. It's also, it's a, a sacrifice, right? So, yeah. without His dying on the cross, you know, there's no. Yeah. There's no salvation. Yeah. So, yeah. Without the resurrection, there's no hope. Yeah, I mean, all the apostles at this point are still damned to hell. That's why they're better off with his leaving. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's look at the book of Acts for a minute. And then we'll take a look at the epistles. And through these two, we'll see some of the things that the Spirit is, has been actively doing. So we'll start with, with um, Christ um, announcing his departure. Um, and so at the beginning, the book of Acts says, and you said, Luke is explaining what he's been writing about to them about what Jesus did. Uh, and then it says, until the day when he, Jesus, was taken up into heaven, after he had given orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, orders by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so there, there are things that by the Spirit they can remember um, and progressively understand. And then verse 8, but you will receive, this is Jesus, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, as far as the ends of the earth. So there's going to be that power 
of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is going to convict of truth, righteousness, and judgment, that Jesus declared that he would do that. The Spirit is going to, um, going to show them where to go. Uh, the Spirit's going to remind them of the words to say when they're in captivity. All kinds of things the Spirit's going to do because He has power. Give all of those gifts. Hmm? Give all of those gifts. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that ability to be able to proclaim the gospel through the secret work the Holy Spirit's doing as people are hearing the gospel. So what happens in, in Acts chapter 2? What do we see? What amazing thing do we see at the beginning of Acts chapter 2 that tells us about this power of the Holy Spirit? It gives us one example, one illustration. And by the way, it's a very visible one. 5,000 are converted because of the preaching of the folk speaking. Yeah. Three, but yeah. Three, Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So Acts chapter 2, you have the descending of the fire with the rush of the wind, right? And then they, the apostles, were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out. So that's incredible. I mean, there's the first time they do this, when they, they receive the Holy Spirit and this amazing thing happens so that everyone can hear them speaking in their own language. They weren't speaking gibberish. No. No. That's, yeah, because... Apostolalia is mentioned by the Apostle Paul later on, but that's a, different, that's a specific gift for a specific purpose. Some people interpret that a little bit. You know? so, you, so you have... You have this, the filling of the Holy Spirit, right? The speaking of tongues. Then you have Peter preach this sermon. Um, Peter's not, it's not been recorded that he's preached before. Yeah, they went out and did that work. But here he is preaching to these Jews and he preaches a message that behind that is the convicting power of the Holy Spirit at work. So those 3,000 at the end, what must we do to be saved? I mean, that's good, not because Peter preached a brilliant sermon, which it is an amazing sermon, you know, for that group of people, but the power of the Holy Spirit convicting them of the truth as they're hearing it. So, power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Here's Acts 10. While Peter was speaking these words, so this is in Cornelius' home, Right, the Gentile, you're not supposed to go in a Gentile home, not supposed to go there, not supposed to go inside, not supposed to be there as a Jew. Peter goes because, because he gets that vision, right? Um, and then Cornelius shows up and goes, well, God sent me to get you. Um, or Cornelius is the messenger. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening. What's happening with that? Well, they're being convicted of Peter's message, of the truth of it. But they're also doing something else. All the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed. So thankfully, he had witnesses yeah. uh, because he's got to tell this story so that the, the Jews will believe that God's taking the message to the Gentiles. So the Jewish Christians will believe. Right. Jewish, yeah. They were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had also been poured out on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. The same thing that happened to the apostles when the Holy Spirit came now is happening to these Gentiles. Not only were they convicted, but there's confirmation by the work of the Holy Spirit to have them speak in different languages. And praise God. So um, there's a whole bunch of verses in Acts, and you should look at every verse where the Holy Spirit's mentioned. And one thing you'll notice, not in every case, one thing you'll notice is how God's accomplishing by the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, exactly what Jesus 
promised and prophesied, you will take, you will be my messengers to Jerusalem, to Samaria, to um, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. It begins to happen because the Holy Spirit enables that to happen. Um, and testifies through his work that, yes, it's supposed to go here. Yes, it's supposed to go here. The apostles aren't thinking that. At best, they're thinking, well, wherever the Jews are, you know, we'll go proclaim it there. But they're not thinking. Peter wasn't thinking, go to the home of Cornelius and proclaim the gospel to them. Then the apostolic teachings. So here we go. Romans 8. And again, there's a ton of verses. Here's Romans 8. Uh, Romans 8. Paul's writing about prayer. 826. Now, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with gatherings or groanings too deep for words. So as we pray, Paul says, the Spirit is at work knowing what God desires for us to pray for, knowing the will of the Father. Because he searches the heart, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So we're praying, um, and that's not just, that doesn't mean just, okay, just pray anything, it doesn't matter. It does. It matters what we pray and how we pray. But just to know that the Spirit is in our prayers interceding with us, knowing the will of the Father. As we're learning the will of the Father, as our minds are being uh, conformed to understand the will of the Father, and nevertheless, through that process of our sanctification, our growing in knowledge of the Scripture, our maturing as a Christian, our becoming more Christ-like, every time we pray, we're praying reverently, we're praying in faith, um, we're praying, and we're trying to learn what the will of the Father is, but the Spirit's at work through our prayers. That's an encouraging verse, isn't it? So the Spirit's at work in prayer, in our prayer. And then we've talked about the readings of, reading of Scripture and understanding them, and we remember the promises of, of Christ, that He'd remind us of everything we've been taught, or His, his disciples, His apostles. 1 Corinthians 10, For to us, God has revealed them through the Spirit, the, the, the truths of the truths of Scripture, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit is from God. So we may know the things freely given to us by God. Uh, just like when Jesus began teaching in parables, and teaching in parables so that those who knew Him those who were his could understand. Now, they needed explanation along the way, but, and those who didn't know him would not understand. So it's kind of what Paul's describing here to the Corinthian church. Now that you have the spirit, you can know and understand more about what God's plan is um, what God's will is, who He is, um, how to respond to what's going on in the world because the Spirit is teaching you how to, how to understand the Scriptures, right? We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words as our minds are being transformed, right? Uh, to more understand who God is and what His will is. So we're cultivating spiritual thoughts 
and we're combining those with spiritual words, scriptures. So how important is, is it to spend time in scriptures? How important it is to, to uh, indwell scriptures in your mind? How important it is for you to pray about that for the Spirit's work in you? Um, so that you're cultivating spiritual thoughts and you've got access to spiritual words? Um, because there you can know he's at work. Can't see it. but you can trust that he's at work as you're reading his words, as you're desiring to cultivate spiritual thoughts that are based on spiritual truth in, in God's word. Amazing. Can't see him, but to trust that that's what he's doing. Second Peter 1.20 and 2 Peter also talks about this is remember in the Old Testament how, how they determined who is a who is a true prophet and who is a false prophet, right? Did the prophecy come true? So there were those measuring sticks. Well, here's a here's the big one: knowing the Spirit is it was present in the writing of Scripture. But know this first of all that no prophecy of Scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. So it's by the work of the Spirit to help interpret the scriptures for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. Here's the other side of it. So it's how do you understand the prophet prophecies? Now it's who gives the prophecies? No prophecy ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So that's the basis for the scriptures being inerrant, authoritative, sufficient, is that uh, the Spirit of God, through the human authors, as Paul talks about in Timothy as well, wrote the scriptures, right? They're God's word. Um, so the Spirit works through all that, Peter confesses. All right. Many, many more. So all these things that you mentioned are true about in scripture about what we see the spirit actively doing in individual believers, in the church, um, uh, in churches all over the globe, in the church throughout history since that day at Pentecost where he first came, all those things Spirit continues to do, actively do. Um, and it's kind of important to think about when you're gathered together as believers uh, to be aware of the Spirit's active, not just in me, but the Spirit's active among the gathered believers together. So when we take the Lord's Supper, when we witness a baptism, when we sing, when we listen to the preached word, all those things, the Spirit is active and present um, in the household of God, anchoring it on the truth in everything. Okay, uh, let's look at a few false teachings and disagreements over the work of the Spirit and who He is. So we'll spend a few minutes on this. First, this is around the second century, leading to the third century, something called Montanism. So there's a fellow named Montanus who declared that the spirit was active in him, that through his voice, he was prophesying. So the spirit was active in him and others believed him. And he had people that would also say things, men and women who were prophets. The prophecy that was happening was uh, a moral slash ethical prophesying. So what Montanus believed was that the church, church was really lax in its practices. It wasn't obedient. 
it was becoming worldly. And so he believed that he was receiving from the Holy Spirit uh, commands for the church. So additions to scripture to express certain ways in which the church should, should be behaving. Um, and so he was a embodiment of the Holy Spirit in a way. And that took root among many people in, his, in, in that time. Um, remember we talked about, we mentioned Tertullian a few weeks ago, and Tertullian, his, his claim about uh, the Son of God. Um, and we looked at uh, where, uh, where he rebutted a particular heresy. Um, Tertullian was opposed to Montanism. But then at one point, he got convinced, no, this is right. And so he became a Montanist. And so his writings are kind of divided. I mean, he's got a whole series of writings, a whole bunch of writings that he did over, over his time. And they're divided by people looking at him and going, okay, was this during his period as a Montanist or was this before? And so they'll analyze him that way. It's fascinating. So anyway, they, what they did was those Montanists, they decided to split from the church because they were so convicted about the message they were receiving from the Holy Spirit and if the church didn't receive it, then they were a false church, an untrue church, and they split off. So this was an early church schism, formed their own church uh, to continue um, prophesying. Did it die out, or is it still existing as something else? Well, it died out. It wasn't until late fourth century where it really began to ebb. So it was around for almost two centuries. Um, this believing that you received a special anointing of the Holy Spirit through prophecy. Prophesying, and it was always continually um, moral, ethical behavior in the church that they were prophesying about. So they were like those Old Testament prophets prophesying against Israel and their punishment is coming unless they repent. So it was like that. I mean, I mean, that's the necessary logical conclusion of the position. If, if these are God's words, God cannot speak unauthoritatively. Yeah. Then therefore, it must be followed and not be considered sin. Right. Yep. So anybody today who claims that God were from God, uh huh. Yeah. God, yeah. Then it must be obeyed. Yeah. Yeah, because what's the, what's the danger if you say I've got a word from God? What's the what are you actually saying? Yeah, which means you're adding to scripture. You're saying, okay, now we've got six, six books. We've got the canon. Oh, this isn't there, but God told me this. And so this is, God said this to me. And this is, you know, this is eternally true. Yeah. And that's... Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, these were specific things, specific instructions for the church. Yeah. And you're not necessarily thinking in that day that, okay, I'm, I'm saying something definitive that's always going to be true. Although they were very convicted about this. They were very convicted about these, the, the way that the church needed to address itself to not be a false church. Because if you're not listening to the Word of God, then you're prone to be, you know, paired away the, the wheat and the chaff, the sheep and the goats. Um, yeah. It was declared a heresy. Um, so even though there was appeal to the, Mont appeal to the Montanists to, um, you know, to, con no, this isn't, this is, this is novelty. This is, this, this is not, uh, what you're saying is not something that's, true with, with, uh, with scripture. Um, but, uh, they rebuked and left. Stepping in for a couple moments of sacred stewardship. Here's Irenaeus. He's around that time. Here's what he said about the scriptures. So remember his, his three points, his three principles, he's Trinitarian, God, the father, God, the son. Here's what he says about God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, through whom the prophets prophesied, the fathers learned the things of God, and the righteous were led forth in the way of righteousness. 
and who in the end times had poured out in a new way upon mankind and all the earth, renewing man unto God. So he's talking about the Old Testament to the New Testament. Um, and by the Spirit, the Father is called the Most High and Almighty, God, Almighty and Lord of hosts. That we may learn concerning God, that he it is who is creator of heaven and earth and all the world, makers of angels and men, Lord of all. So the Spirit testifies of the, of the Father. Uh, here's the Spirit in salvation and in now and his work in the words. So he's reflecting a little bit on on passages uh, from uh, from the epistles, uh, Paul's, uh, and for this reason, the baptism of our regeneration. So that's the he's equating that with what John said about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of regeneration precedes these three points. God the Father bestowing on us regeneration through his Son by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is actively at work as we come to faith, as we become regenerate. For as many as carry in them the Spirit of God are led to the Word, that is, to the Son. So the Spirit leads you to Christ. That's what he's, that's what he's supposed to do in his convicting in the preaching of the gospel. Son brings you to the Father, the Father causes him to possess incorruption. Without the Spirit, it's not possible to behold the Word of God, nor without the Son can any draw near to the Father, for the knowledge of the Father is the Son. So he's describing the, the functions that, so he's the relationship of the Spirit with the, with the Son, but he's also describing the functions of the Spirit, Spirit and the Son's relationship to the Father. And the knowledge of the Son of God is through the Holy Spirit. He testifies of him. He glorifies him. When you're convicted about the truth of, of, the, of the Son and what he accomplished, that's the Spirit at work. On the, the monotheism thing, you know, Paul in his letter to the Galatians was pretty clear. If anyone comes to you with a gospel contrary to what we already preach, that's yeah. a that curse. It's not from God. So, yeah. you know, if the prophecy is adding to or, you know, Yeah, and that was the debate, really. It's, okay, they're claiming to add something new or something that different, um, or it's minimizing something in Scripture that's very clear. Um, yeah. The pneumatakoi, yeah. Yeah. Special word, yeah, special prophecy. Yep. An early version of, uh, of uh, um, who's the Mormon guy? Yeah. Numitakwe. So they affirm the homoousios of the Father and the Son, that Father and Son are, are one in essence, one in substance. So this was during the time of the Ni Nicene Creed and that debate. Um, so they affirm, yes, that's true but deny the full deity of the Spirit. That's in the fourth century. So here's my friend Athanasius. He writes upon that. Another thing they were called is a tropicoi. Uh, but he's saying, okay, they affirm the full deity of the Son. So Athanasius said, if they've got agreement on the Son's deity, they should also use that same logic um, about the Spirit. Because if you have Wrong, right theology about the Son, you should have right theology about the Spirit. Because everything that's said about the Spirit in the Scriptures. But if you have wrong theology about the Spirit, well, that implies you have wrong theology about the Son. Because of everything the Son says about the Spirit. Um, and the Scriptures say about the Spirit. So here's what he wrote. If therefore the Son, because of his proper relationship with the Father, and because the proper offspring of his essence, is not a creature, but is in one essence with the Father... The Holy Spirit, likewise, because of his proper relationship with the Son, through whom he is given to all men, and who is all that he has, cannot be a creature. It's impious to call him so. If you read the Scripture and see everything it says about the Spirit, and you agree the Son is divine, then you can't come to the conclusion that the, that the Spirit is not divine also. Of 
try to refer to it as a creature rather than a person. Yeah. And sometimes it's just sloppiness. Yeah. 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 So, so that was back in 357. Uh, then uh, in 374, so we're leading up to, to uh, Constantinople. 374, this is Basil of Caesarea, and, and he talks about how he prays um, and how he gets criticized when he prays uh, or, or when he's giving a doxology, an expression of the Father, Son, and Spirit uh, with the Son, together with the Holy Ghost, through the Son, in the Holy Ghost. And so he gets attacked by this, by those same people who are denying the deity of the Holy Spirit. You can't say that because he's, he's not divine. He's not an entity, even. Um, and he walks through his logic with all the names of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, walks through that to declare that he is um, incorporeal, purely immaterial, indivisible. He's deity. Then finally, Constantinople. Do you remember Nicaea? Um, Constantinople gives a same testimony of, of Christ, of Christ and the Father, uh, of, and then mentions the uh, God the Son came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. Same language in Nicaea. But then you get to the end of the Nicene Creed and you have, we believe in the Holy Spirit. So nothing more about him. Well, Nicaea was really focused on the relationship of the Father and the Son and trying to get that right when they wrote the Creed. But Constantinople, so this is 57 years later, 56 years later, um, 381, decides we need to give this a better definition. In part, it was a response to the heresy that happened. And in part, it's a, we've thought more about the Holy Spirit. And we want, want to make sure that he is expressed um, orthodoxy, expressed truly. Um, it's an expression that reflects the truth of Scripture. So we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, and who has spoken to the prophets. And then he goes on to talk about the church. But proceeds from the Father. Remember that for a moment. Proceeds from the Father. So we have another disagreement that happens. Um, the Western church determines that it's not just proceeded from the Father, but it's from the Father and the Son. So that's called the filioque clause. So they added that and the Son because they're reflecting on Scripture and they see, they see things where, no, it's, he's sent by Christ as well. And so they decide we're going to add that, that he proceeds not only from the Father, but the Father and the Son. The Eastern Church disagrees, uh, and they reject that idea, um, and they call it a desecration of the, of the Creed of 381, desecration of Constantinople, that creed, because it proceeds from the Father, and you can't change the language of that, that creed. We all agreed on that. We thought, that we thought about that you know, 200 years ago. Um, and so uh, that's a catalyst for the church to split, one of the catalysts to split. So in 559, Synod of Orange, they affirm this to be true. That's Rome. 866, um, almost, what, yeah, 300 years later, it comes up again. There's a fight over that, that clause between the Eastern and Western church. And finally, in 1054, they split. So one says, no, it's only from the Father that he proceeds. The other says, no, he's proceeding from the Father and the Son because the Son is part of his sending. So, so what's the basis for their rejection? Just that the Spirit does not proceed from the Son? Yeah, I mean, it was that. Plus, it's, plus it was the, um, at, at first it was there, just you're desecrating the creed. We agreed on this. This is going to cause trouble. Yeah. yeah, but they're also thinking about the scriptures because everybody's doing that. So, and they're not, they're not seeing that that is, um, that whatever Christ is doing, no, there's only one that he proceeds from and that's the Father.
So every crisis involved, the right way to, huh? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. They, they say maybe, but he's not receiving from Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Spirit of Christ because Christ promised he would come. Uh, Spirit of Christ because he represents Christ. Because Christ has ascended. So that's how they're interpreting those passages. Anything like that, they've got their interpretation for it. Um, but the West says, no, no. Um, and there's other passages they look at too. And so, no, he was, he was sent by the Son. So he's, even the son says from the father, but then he declares that he's sending the spirit. So, yeah. Well, different than sending him uh, to indwell. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, that is what you receive when you, when you believe. Um, you, re you receive the Holy Spirit. Um, and, uh, and who was the promiser and the operator of that? Well, Christ was. Um, yeah. Is that still a disagreement? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. And they tried to mend the fences uh, past 1054. There was a, a period to bring them back together. But they were so split apart. This is just one thing that split them. This wasn't the only thing. But this is a major, major, um, we, we don't agree to disagree. <laughs> uh, you are wrong in how you're interpreting the scriptures, wrong enough that you're changing a creed that the entire empire agreed upon, all the churches agreed, agreed upon. So you're wrong. No, no, uh, we've thought about this, and this is the right way to understand the son's involvement with the coming of the Spirit. Um, so, yeah, they could not reconcile on that one. One more, the second baptism of the Holy Spirit. So this is attached to the charismatic Pentecostal movement. Uh, really began in the early 20th century, um, emphasizing the work of the Holy Spirit. So there's a subsequent baptism of the Holy Spirit marked by tongues uh, and healings, Etc. So I just want to show you real quick competing confessions. Here's the Baptist faith and message and what it says. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, fully divine. He inspired men of old to write the scriptures. Through illumination, he enables men to understand truth. He exalts Christ. He convicts men of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's John's gospel, Christ's words. He calls men to the Savior and affects regeneration. At the moment of regeneration, he baptized every believer into the body of Christ. So that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Not the water baptism, but at that moment. Uh, he cultivates Christian character, comforts believers, um, and bestows his spiritual gifts by which they serve God through the church. He seals the believer until the day of final redemption. His presence in the Christian is the guarantee that God will bring the believer into the fullness of the stature of Christ. He enlightens and empowers the believer and the church in worship, evangelism, and service. So all these things about who the Spirit is and what He does. All right? So that's the, I mean, that's the, you know, the standard evangelical belief about the Holy Spirit at work and one expression of it in Baptist faith message. Here's the United Oneness Pentecostal Church International. So the oneness is in this first part. There is one God who has revealed himself as Father through his Son in redemption and as the Holy Spirit by emanation. So it's a, um, it's a um, progressive, um, a modalist expression of God, Father, then Son, then Spirit. So there's the modalism. So what do you think they'll say about the Spirit? This is interesting. We obey the gospel by repentance, death to sin, water baptism in the name of Jesus, uh, so that's burial, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial sign of speaking in tongues 
as the Spirit gives the utterance, resurrection. So there's the second baptism of the Holy Spirit, or the second baptism, and it's the baptism receiving the Holy Spirit, that second receiving of the Holy Spirit. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the sign that you received that second baptism, is the ability to speak in tongues. Well, not, it doesn't have to be every time you pray, but, it, but it's something that you have and will continue to practice, right? Because it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Huh? Continue to do. Yeah. I mean, it's not every time you pray, but you continue to have that. That, that might be a lot of pressure to fake it. Mm -hmm. We had a friend that did that. I have actually heard of some yeah. places where they teach their children to do it. Yeah. We had a friend that, uh, that as a kid, uh, he went to a Pentecostal church um, and he decided that, well, to be accepted here, I got to do this. So he faked it and then realized later that that was, that was false and wrong because it really, it didn't actually happen. Um, so Pentecostal church, um, assemblies of God, um, there's different facets that believe that there is this, there is this second baptism and it's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the manifestation of it is this. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The only thing that that. And when does the second part happen specifically? Whenever you start speaking in tongues, I'm like, okay, there it goes. But yeah. That not everybody gets the gift of the tongue. Not everybody has all the gifts. That's right. Right. Yeah. That clearly they all speak. Right. And the occasion that you have the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so think about Cornelius's house, that scripture we looked at, right? Um, and when they were convicted of the message, um, they spoke in tongues. But why did they? Why did that happen? They weren't speaking in a strange language. But why did that happen? Oh, by the way, I can send you these slides if you want me to. Okay. Yeah. Um, what? Yeah. And they were speaking in their own language so that Yeah, remember what the what that passage says, the believing Jews witnessed that. And then next chapter, Peter's repeating the whole thing to you know, to other Jews to confirm for them, hey, it's it's acceptable to God. In fact, God's plan is to as the gospel is going to the Gentiles. And the evidence for them was that what they saw happen when those believers um, were convicted of the truth of the gospel, that speaking in tongues. So that was a normative thing that went on. That was, that was the spirit at work giving a clear, um, a clear um, to Peter and those believing Jews, a clear message that, no, that wasn't just a dream to go there and, and talk to them. The gospel now goes to the Gentiles. And then Peter in chapter 11 explains that. Um, the Jews in Jerusalem are like, oh, well, I guess God's given the Gentiles the same spirit he gave to us. I guess God's the same Gentiles. <laughs> so so what, yeah. what happens on the day of Pentecost when everyone started speaking? It was just the apostles. It was the apostles. Yeah. What, what was yeah. that as a spiritual baptism? Because Jesus, when he was baptized, he said, yeah. uh, or John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but the one, the one that's going to come is going to you know, baptize you yeah. with the spirit and fire. Right. So, yeah. Uh, the Holy Spirit filled his apostles and they began to speak in, in, in tongues, which would be evidence of the Holy Spirit, right? It, it, uh, it would be, yeah. Um, and um, in, in the so, so Jesus said, when we saw in chap, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, and when the, when, the, when the Spirit comes upon you, you'll receive power. So that's when that happened. That's when the, the apostles 
receive the Holy Spirit as Jesus promised. Yeah, there's one there's one mentioned in, in the Gospels where Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit on them, but that wasn't a indwelling presence going forward. That's when it happened. When you received the Holy Spirit, so they received it at at that moment at Pentecost. Um, it's, just, it's an extraordinary event to, to demonstrate the inauguration of the church age. So the 12 yeah. apostles do it, and then yeah. next they go to the Samaritans, then they say, oh, we see that the Samaritans received the same Holy Spirit we received. And yeah. then they go to the God-created Gentiles, the same thing happens. And so then they go to the regular Gentiles, and that happens. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's extraordinary events inaugurating the expansion of the church age, and, and it never happens. Right. Like so, 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 Yeah. 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 That's the that's the that's the way the Book of Acts is lined up. Right. It's the Jews, and then it's the Samaritans. Yeah. Yeah. Because when the believing Jews see those, hear those tongues, I mean, hear those languages that they're speaking, they remember back to when that happened at Pentecost, and so that's the confirmation. So what happened at Pentecost was necessary. It was a, it was a work of the Spirit to set the table for what was going to happen when Peter goes to Cor Acts chapter 10, when Peter goes to Cornelius' house, Cause, right? Because he quotes, in, in Peter's sermon, he quotes Joel, the Old Testament prophecy about in this, it shall be in the last days, right? So in these last days, in the last age, in this, what is the church age yeah. now, this is when God is poured forth the Spirit. Yeah. So it's a, just an extraordinary example of the now, now, another question is, can the Holy Spirit continue to do things like that um, in this day and age. Well, so, of course he could, yeah. because he's full of God. And I've heard missionaries talk about when they go to a new people group and they'll see that. Yeah, I mean, people have seen things, missionaries have seen things on the field where they go, oh my goodness, <laughs> look what happened here. But not every but, Sunday at 9.15 and things right. like that. Yeah. Born again. Yeah. So, the, born again. Yeah, unless you're born again. Yeah. So it's the, that's the regeneration by the Holy Spirit. So because he says water and the Spirit. So the water is when you're born from the womb, and then the the born again. So the that, that rebirth is born of the Spirit. When would that happen? How would that process work? Happens at the moment that you're that uh, you come to faith in Christ. Happens at the moment that you have that conviction and believe the gospel. That's where you begin to get understanding yeah. of the scripture. Yeah. So, so, so there's that, there's, there's inviting Christ in, and then that's the reborn again process. Because I agree with the left side, I agree with the Pentecostal church that there's, there's that asking Jesus to come in, and this is a, and, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I love to be wrong, I love to not get fully wrong. Yeah. But, uh, but there's this asking Jesus to come into your heart, It's still me in control most of the time. And then there's, there's yeah. a point where you come to this surrender. And it's this surrender where, right. you, I, where you take your hands off the list and you just think, well, yeah. I, it's not my will, but your will. And that moment is the reborn again for me. Like yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, scripture is confusing salvation with sanctification. Who I don't know either. Yeah. Because the minute you say, you know, where, however you say, I accept Jesus, however you say, that I, you know, I, I believe, that's the moment where, that, that's, and that's the moment where the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is yeah. now in you, Physical present in you. Kind of yeah. That is where you will begin to receive understanding of Scripture. So, so I think, I think, I think that will be very good. Yeah. But what, what I think what everybody would encourage is go to the Scripture and read how does the Scripture describe the Salvation. Yeah. What is the necessary result of salvation, of regeneration? Does it require a second extraordinary event or other necessary implications from salvation? Yeah. I, I had a, a, a second event happen. I, I accepted Christ when I was 18. At 30 years old, I, I said, I can't do this anymore. And I yeah. think that's all I said. And I meant it with my heart. I said, I can't do yeah. this anymore. This white funnel of light comes around me, surrounds me. Everything begins to shake. Hmm. Uh, my heart begins to feel, feel, feel overflow with this unconditional love. Yeah. This peace that was undescribable. Like I thought I knew what peace was. This peace was unlike anything I've ever heard. And 
No, but in front of you, I, I believe that this is the piece that surpasses all of Yeah. And then I went into visions, thousands and thousands of visions about my whole life. This is why, you know, this goes in. This is why I brought you here. This is why I allowed you to go through this. Show me thousands of these moments. And then I'm in a room, and there's a window about this big, way, way high up on the ceiling, just one. The sun could have been anywhere. It could have been facing north, south, west. I would have been a foot backwards. It would have been the wrong angle. The last vision, it said, it said to look up. And I look, all the, I'm crying, and my eyelids are, are lit up red uh, from the sun, like breaking through the clouds. And I feel the heat in my forehead. It must have just popped through the clouds. And I open my eyes, and I look up, and it's the sun. It's square this window, and the whole sky just explodes with these colors, like the, the, the sky flew apart. And this rainbow is slowly yeah. swirling out of the sun. But, but it's a complete accident. I just said, I can't do this anymore. And I just went to Harry But I was yeah. a Christian. I was I invited Christ to spend my life when I was 18, but this 30 year old thing is, is like a surrender. And to me, that was being reborn again. A couple of days later, I woke up speaking in tongues out of my sleep. Um, you know, didn't know nothing about nothing. This is all accidental. Didn't know the Bible. You know, just my mom brought me to church. Yeah. Didn't, didn't know really anything. So, so I would agree from my experience with the, the left side of this, this second thing. This Which would mean most of in this room are not. Which means most of us in this room don't have the Holy Spirit. Most most of us don't because. If it's required to have yeah. an experience mm -hmm. of a surrender. Well, um, well there's right. a difference between he's inviting God into your life and making and surrendering. Yes. So, so you're, you're differentiating between salvation. So, you, right, so you're saying this occurred at 30, you were saved before we get to Christ. Yeah. yeah. So he's making a differentiation. Difference right. between what salvation and what? And this is yeah. that experience. I, so I think there is a difference between inviting God into your life and truly surrendering your life and making Him Lord, and that is the point of salvation. But that's the second part where yeah. I did, and I had that experience because the second I did it, and it, it was it was it was like it wasn't one foot in, one foot out anymore. It was all in. Yeah. It wasn't ninety nine point nine percent you know in the world, and then I still wanted to be a little bit of the world. I, I went all in accidentally because I didn't have a choice. It was rock bottom for me. Last uh, I didn't have a, a plan B. I yeah. Supernatural experiences. You know, I'm listening to your sermon. It was everything like that. Clouds broke apart. Uh, my cup overflowed. It was this unconditional love. We went into visions, evidence of the Holy Spirit showing visions and touch of the mm -hmm. visions and, and showing all these you know, things in my life. Um, it, was, it was everything you said, you know. And, and, and I was re I read a Bible verse when it happened. It was Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God verse. But then it brought me to Isaiah 11 and 1. And, 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 the, and the Holy Spirit brought me there. It, it was like talking. I couldn't believe it. And it, it was the Isaiah 11 1 where it says, uh, I have it right here. It says, yeah. A shoot of Jesse, uh, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Uh, from his roots, will, uh, a branch will bear fruit. Uh, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and power. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. Well, let's let these guys go. Yeah. So. No, I gotta, yeah, because yeah. Yeah, yeah. they've got to pick up kids yeah, exactly. and stuff. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.